Good evening, and welcome to Voices of the Vietnam Era. My name is Matt Albright, and I'm proud to be your host tonight. Voices of the Vietnam Era is part of the All Pueblo Weeds program. All Pueblo Weeds this year is based around the things they carried by Tim O'Brien. And you still have time. A week from today is the big book lover's ball. Go to pueblolibrary.org to get your tickets, and you can still be involved. But tonight, we have a very special program. Voices of the Vietnam Era is a partnership with the Center for American Values in the Pueblo City and County Library District, bringing you local voices of Vietnam veterans telling their experience firsthand of what they went through. Tonight, we're very excited and proud to have Bob Beagle here. Bob was a 19-year-old medic. He found himself in Vietnam as a Fleet Marine Force Corpsman, providing direct support for Marines in combat from 1969 to 1970. Among his many awards while serving in the war and his long career following was the Purple Heart. Tonight, Bob's going to tell us firsthand about his personal experience of trying his best to save Marines in the heat of war. May I introduce my friend, Bob Beagle. Evening, Matt. Evening. How are you, Bob? Good. Good, good. I really appreciate you coming and doing this. Um, Super important program. We do this not just for our local veterans, which we know many of them watch this, but also the kids and, and other folks in the community that might not be familiar of these amazing stories. Of course, Pueblo is known as the home of heroes, and we know there's four Congressional Medal of Honor recipients. But what we always say, and, and what I truly believe in my heart, is Pueblo is not the home of heroes because we had four guys. Pueblo is surrounded and embedded with amazing veterans, with amazing stories and and just uh, experiences that we wanted to highlight. So thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Um, to get started, fairly simple. Um, why don't you tell everybody uh, where you're from, a little bit about your, your history. I was raised in the Central Valley of California. I grew up 15 miles from the nearest town. That's where I went to high school, way out in the middle of nowhere, a place called Prunedale. Uh, now it's... Uh, Pretty much solid city down Highway 101 from San Francisco, way down probably south of us. Uh, it was, you know, I grew up in the country. Now, did you have service in your family? Were there members of your family that served? My father was in World War II in the Navy. My stepdad was uh, in Korea. Well, he was supposed to go to Korea, but when he was being selected with the Army where he was going to go, they said, OK, we need you in the engineering battalion to go to Alaska. So he spent his entire enlistment in Alaska. And back in my family, we've done some family history. I have uh, ancestors that were in the Civil War. So, yeah. But. From my understanding, the one military member that really kind of guided you was your uncle. My correct? uncle. He was a master chief dispersing clerk. And uh, when I was thinking about it, after I graduated high school, I wanted to get away from the Central Valley of California. I mean, there was nothing going on there. My family situation at the time was not very good. My mom's health was very bad. My dad was an alcoholic. So things really, as I got older, just became more and more intolerant, intolerable. So my uncle said, uh, I'll get you in the Navy. Okay. Um, you know, I've been seeing a lot of stuff going on with Vietnam. My parents did not want me to go to Vietnam. And uh, my uncle said, this is, this is a good possibility. I'll, I'll get him in. Well, I've been working for many summers and then uh, on weekends for a veterinarian close to where we live. And I enjoyed doing that sort of thing. I enjoyed medicine. Of course, I was working with animals at the time, which was also a bonus. But I got more of an uh, insight in what it takes to have someone who is injured, someone or something like it, any animal. We did mostly large animals, cows and horses around there, but also cats and dogs coming in with a problem or an injury or an illness and making them better. So that was sounded like a good idea to me. And when I got into boot camp, they discovered that I had uh, 
piping skills and that I had uh, my IQ, my intelligence, put me on the top of all my ASVAB scores. But I said, okay, you're going to be your company clerk and recruit CPO. Okay, so that got me out of a lot of marching. I had a bicycle that I went around boot camp in. And I was designated as going to hospital corps school. Most of the guys that I was in boot camp with were seamen recruits. I was a hospitalman recruit, which uh, was kind of unusual. So they knew where I was going. Something that you were excited about that you kind of yeah. were striving yeah, for? Yeah, that when you go into placement in boot camp, they kind of give you an idea what to expect when you get out. They said, well, you know, you can go into the hospital uh, a couple of years with your uh, desire to be in medicine. You can then go to medical school and the Navy will pay for it. I said, well, okay. Sounds like a good idea to me. Um, when I graduated from boot camp, I went to hospital corps school, which at the time was 16 weeks. So they give you kind of the basics and yet they expect you to learn pretty much of your job while you're doing it. Whatever posting you get, you learn under people who are more senior to you and the situations as they come up, you learn on the job. And I went to a hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, someone asked me to work in orthopedics because they were short in orthopedics. So I went to work for the orthopedic surgeon and we were doing casting and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I ended up working on the eighth floor of the Naval Hospital in Jacksonville, which has now been totally decommissioned. Not much there anymore, but all floor, eight floors were active because Vietnam was very busy. And on the orthopedics floor, I got uh, exposure to a lot of these Marines coming back because it was a Naval Hospital and the Marines are a department of the Navy although most of them won't admit that, uh, they do work for the Navy. They're supposed to be our seagoing troops. But uh, they came into the hospital. A lot of them were in total body cast from their chest down to their toes. Uh, a lot of them had through and through gunshot wounds of the thighs. So, you know, we would have to tend to every need that this guy has. He couldn't do anything for himself. Uh, he could eat, and that was about all. So every other function he had, plus changing the dressings on the wounds, um, it was us, those that worked up there. The nurses, you know, they, they gave the rounds, gave medication, but mostly the people who tended to the needs of these wounded Marines were the corpsmen. So having experienced that, um, you made a decision that most people with some people that may be watching, I don't want to say most, but many people would think would be a little bit strange. I mean, you saw the casualties of war. You saw some of the worst wounds in these, these poor Marines that have seen the worst of it. And yet you volunteered to yes. go over there. I was yeah. set to be at the Naval Hospital for as usually it's a four year tour, but I volunteered to go to fleet. Uh, medical Service School, FMSS, and that was in Camp Pendleton. And I knew if once you go to FMSS, there's only one place to go at the time was uh, Vietnam. I, I could have been stationed at a Marine Corps base somewhere, but the odds of a corpsman being stationed at a Marine Corps base during Vietnam was pretty slim because they were losing corpsmen at a horrendous rate. But I felt after working with these guys, I needed to be able to do something a little closer. Maybe I could keep them from getting out of a, getting into a hospital like the one I was working in and some of the horrendous wounds that I saw. There were a lot of amputations, a lot of, a lot of things that's going to change this guy's life from now on. Guys are 20 years old, so I'm even younger than that. So, yes. <laughs> You didn't go directly to Vietnam, though. I, I always love talking to veterans because not every story is, is tragic. In your time pre-Vietnam, where well, did you go? after FMSS, and this was about 30 days of field medical service training, which is you run up and down hills carrying stretchers. 
you know, you learn to treat battle casualties. They give you uh, a, what they call a unit one, which is a medical bag about the size of a fanny pack. And this is what you're supposed to patch all these Marines up and keep them alive until they can get back into a field hospital or farther back. They sent us as a group. Uh, it used to be in previous wars, they would send Marines as a unit. So if you belong to Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, you'd go over as Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines. They were going through people and the casualty rate was so high that they would fill up a plane with replacements. And basically that's what I was. I was a replacement for a corpsman that had to get made back home or had died. So they put us on a plane. We stopped in Hawaii and they wouldn't let us out of the airport because they were afraid that if we got out of the airport, uh, they might have a little trouble getting us back on the plane again. But we got to Okinawa, went to Camp Hansen, and we had, everybody was waiting uh, to go the next day to get in a transport plane to go into Da Nang. Well, we got on the plane, flew over to Da Nang, and the air base was being rocketed at the time, and also Freedom Hill, the exchange, and all that stuff was getting knocked flat. So. They turned the plane around and took us back to Okinawa. Well, waiting for the next opportunity for us to go, I was assigned to work in the shot clinic. And there's a tremendous number of uh, shots that one gets, immunizations for all the diseases, everything from plague to, to uh, uh, hepatitis, all kinds of things, diphtheria, all a series of these things that uh, you had to get before you went into a tropical climate, yellow fever, uh, dengue, all kinds of things. And, you know, they're generally pretty painful. And the majority of these things are administered by this air gun. And anybody who's been through boot camp in the military knows what those things are like. If you flinch, you've got a little scar like that because the the nozzle on this thing shoots a high pressure air into your arm with the immunization, whatever the serum is. And if you twitch, it's gonna make a nice little cut. Well, I worked in the immunization area and we, I guess we were there for another couple of weeks. And I discovered that if I went from barracks to barracks with these Marines with the international immunization stamp and I signed off the gamma globulin shot, which is the hepatitis one, and they, that's what they say is peanut butter because it, it's very, very thick. When they inject it, there's only one place it can go. And all of these Marines line up and they get the gamma globulin shot. But I was stamping off their shot cards with this with the international immunization stamps and getting $5 a shot. So that was beer money. And in Okinawa, they didn't care if you were 21 or not. You, you could get go and buy beer. So before they realized what was going on, because these guys would go on to the planes and I would be in the shock clinic before the next group of Marines would get onto the plane to go to Vietnam. And they look at these shot cars. Wait a minute. The, the gamma globulin shot is signed off. You're supposed to go through here to get that. Oh, already had it. Sorry. Doc got me. Okay. Uh, so before they realized what was happening. I got on my plane and went to Vietnam. So I made a good bit of money giving off, signing off those shots to get beer money. Um, then you got to Vietnam and you had a epiphany well, of some sorts. I looked around. The first impression I got when we got off the plane, it was ungodly hot hot and humid. And there was, uh, because we landed at the air base, there is a big fuel dump. And the smell of diesel fuel came up in my nose and I just about lost it, just about threw up. Uh, that's the overwhelming smell there between the red mud and dirt and the diesel smell. They put us on a truck and took us to uh, third map, third Marine Amphibious Force headquarters. That's where we were going to get assigned to our units, all these replacements. And as we're driving up this mud or dirt road, very thick, red, nasty stuff, throwing up dust in the air, there were Vietnamese uh, women and children along the side of the road. And some Marine 
uh, yelled over the side because these ladies were using the roadside ditch to go to the bathroom. So they pulled up their pajama legs and they were screaming and hollering and, and waving at them. And I said, oh, this is not what I thought I was going to see when I got here. These people were in the hurts. I mean, they were living at a level that I couldn't have imagined. I mean, I, I lived out in the country, but, you know, I had all the amenities. I could go into town and get a hamburger if I wanted. You know, you had television. You had no air conditioning where I was, but, you know, that was the times. But everything else, you had what you needed. These people didn't have the basics. And it, uh, I got the impression right away. I said, hmm. We're supposed to be saving these people from being overcome by the communists. Their most important need that I could see was just day-to-day -day subsistence, food, protection, a safe place to be. And I mean, you see these guys coming with guns and the trucks full of the trucks, tanks going up and down the road. Uh, I don't know I, what they could possibly have thought about that. So, and um, folks that don't know about what corpsmen do. Now, many of us have seen the movies, and, and obviously you've had your own experience of what a corpsman does when in, in the midst of heated combat when someone's hollering for a corpsman. But obviously you were there every day, and that didn't happen every yeah. day. So would you mind telling the viewers a little bit about what a corpsman does well, or did? Well, talked about well, that that bag that they give us a unit one one of the first things that i did is i got rid of that bag because it was a big white circle with a red cross on it and if you carried this unit one bag uh, you were identified as being the only medical help this marine may have so you became the target and it was the radioman the corpsman and usually the young lieutenants that got singled out by snipers and stuff so i emptied out that bag and i found in a demolition bag that they would keep C4 in and I packed everything in there and then I went to the clinic to try to find any other stuff that I would need because uh, you know 24 7 you were their doc you know if guy had a cold you know he had a cut on his finger he had a blister you know something happened he stepped on something went through his foot you had to fix it um, we lived with the Marines day and night so if something happened in the middle of the night, you know, guys got, you know, got in trouble. They got arguing with each other. Um, Doc was there to try to fix it. And one of the biggest issues that we had during the rainy season was when you were on a, a march, you were on patrol or whatever, uh, you were wet the entire time. You know, the uniform, you, usually everybody cut the sleeves off their jungle utility jackets and it was more of a vest because it was just too stinking hot. And the boots that we had were really not suitable for jungle. I mean, they call them jungle boots, but they're made out of canvas. And on the inside, the foot pad is made out of uh, fiberglass. So they keep water inside these boots and you have thick socks that you have to wear because otherwise you rub your feet raw with blisters on these things and they get something called immersion foot or jungle rot. And this is something, you know, soldiers have dealt with since World War I or before, I'm sure, with immersion foot. They called it trench foot. But I would have to, every time we stopped, I would have the Marines take their boots off. And this is a problem because this is about 10 inches of lacing from where the eyelets start all the way to the top of the boots. And if you don't lace them up tight, then you're gonna rub blisters on your feet. So getting them off, if you stop for a break or stop for walk, which was another issue because people got dehydrated very quickly, I had to have everybody take off their boots and take their socks off and let their feet dry out. But you had to stop long enough for that to be able to happen. And in a humid climate, it was tough. One of the biggest things were these big jungle ruts, sores that they would get. I still have uh, scars on my ankles from this stuff, but I made up a concoction. I looked at the stuff that they had at the clinic, and I got some potassium permanganate, which is an antiseptic. I got ointment, an ointment to help relieve the sores, and I put that together, and that worked great. 
for jungle rap. But they had to have a chance to get the socks off and their feet to dry. Otherwise, it wouldn't get any better. You get huge, huge wounds from that. Uh, if we have some youth viewers, you were 19 yep. years old. Um, if most of us, if we walked into the doctor and a 19-year-old walked in, we'd say, oh, okay, most of us civilians. But you were asked to do this. And you've said something that really struck me in the past. You've said, well, yes, I did it because those were my Marines. Do you mind elaborating on that? Yeah, I, I still get a little bit emotional about this stuff. When you go through the training you, it's emphasized to you that you are the only thing between this Marine in the field and death. Because a lot of the wounds or the injuries and things that get out there, you may not be able to get a medevac helicopter in in enough time to keep this guy from dying. Because in Vietnam, you know, they don't, they didn't have as much in the way of access as they do now. I mean, they've refined that since World War II in Korea. All of these things in the intervening years, they developed the emergency evacuation of troops from the field to a science. And it used to be that probably World War II, if you were wounded in the field, you had about a 30% chance, depending on the extent of the wound, to make it to any kind of medical facility because there was just no way to do it. It went up to about 50% in Korea and then 70% about that in Vietnam. And now the chance is in the field because of the uh, advancement in the emergency medical equipment that the guys can carry uh, just about everybody, and unless it's so traumatic that you know there's no way you're gonna survive anyway. But these guys, they were my responsibility. <sighs> Still my Marines. Sure. Yeah, I still feel like and just to give uh, some perspective, or um, how does the Corman system work? I mean, again, many of us uh, or, or viewers, their view may be shaped by the films they see. And always, anytime there's about a corpsman or medic and, and someone's always there. Um, but there wasn't a ton of corpsmen around, correct? Right. Usually you had, uh, there are four platoons in a company, a Marine Corps company, and usually a corpsman per platoon. I was the Fox Company, first platoon, Fox Company, 2-7. That was me. I was the corpsman. They're usually junior guys, uh, E3s, E4s. So you'd have four of them for company. You had uh, a group of corpsmen in the battalion aid station, which was attached to the uh, battalion command post. And then uh, you'd have a senior corpsman responsible for those guys in the uh, battalion aid station. But out in the field, if you're on patrol, you were it with that platoon. And, uh, yeah, I came off the street at 19, said I was a farm boy. I was out in the middle of nowhere. But, you know, I had everything that I felt, felt that I needed. And when I got in the bush, it was like almost like a living in the Stone Age. You know, you were out living in a foxhole. Water was a problem, particularly during the, the dry season, a uh, safe uh, source of water. You know, you were out places where there weren't any wells. And if you drank from the well, you know, I had so many intestinal parasites. When I finally got back to the States, it took me a long time to get rid of the effects of that because you drank the water that was available. So, yeah, I mean... You did what you could, but at 19, with the minimal training that I had, I, I became 20 in Vietnam. Uh, a lot of guys didn't, unfortunately. They didn't make it to 20, but I did. And uh, coming out of there, you know, I, you go into a situation where you get into a firefight and you're walking along. You may have uh, been in a fire support base like we were at LZ Baldy and LZ Ross. You'd be there for a while and you go through the normal routine. I mean, you stay in your company area, you do a morning sick call with the Marines, anybody has any problems. And then you go and you either eat your sea rats or if you're lucky, they set up a chow hall in the, in the rear base and you go eat. 
You go out at night on patrol. And if nothing's really going on, you come back and you go to sleep. And this may go on for a number of of months, days, weeks, months, whatever. But when it really gets hot, when there's a push from the, (coughs) excuse me, the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong, I mean, you go out at night and it's suddenly chaos. It may be nothing. You're walking along and all of a sudden things are exploding everywhere. Mortars come in, you're receiving uh, rocket RPGs are coming in. And they say, Corman, because the first thing that happens, somebody's going to get hit. So whatever you're doing, you drop it and you go there. Most people are going to want to go away from there if they're being shot, but we can't. We have to go there. That's what I did. Yeah. Now, Bob, I know that's, uh, I, I don't know if you have the uh, great answer for this, uh, but do you believe it was the training or something within you or just, I mean, does it, it just become a, a, a reaction at that point? Well, I knew a lot of guys, a lot of corpsmen. I went through corps school with a lot of them went to Vietnam to FMSS. Part of it is training. But if you don't have that desire to do whatever it takes to help, then you may find yourself in a little wad in the corner someplace when stuff goes on. Uh, You know, they, they say about heroes, heroes is opportunity. Stuff happens and you react and you do what's necessary in the moment. So I think everybody's a potential hero. It just depends on their psyche. I mean, what is causing me to do what I'm going to do? If self-preservation is the first thing, you won't last long. That's really one of our big missions with this program is, again, in the home of heroes of all places, that there were thousands of upon thousands of heroes over there just doing the yeah. job and came home to very little fanfare, obviously very little thanks um, and you yourself are decorated and, and have the, the, the one award that nobody ever would like to get, the, the Purple Heart. Uh, I'm not going to press you on that particular situation because I know it's difficult for Minera veterans to talk. But I do want to talk a little bit about something that is often talked about, the politics of the day. And I don't, I'm not asking you to say your polit- political views or anything like that, but we always hear about this division in politics, but there's a common theme for nearly every single veteran from Vietnam I spoke to is once you go over there, it appears that all that seemed to disappear. Am I correct? Correct. You know, we go, one of the first things they did when, uh, before we got on the plane to go, they were giving you all these rah-rah speeches and stuff and about, you know, what we're doing to help the South Vietnamese people resist the communist North. We get to Okinawa and they show us, the Green Berets, the John Wayne film, you know, everybody's going hoorah, hoorah during the whole movie. You get over there, and particularly when you get out into the villages, you realize that the people out there really, they only want three things in life. They want to be able to raise their children. They want to be able to take care of their family. I mean, provide food, provide some sort of uh living and then to have a safe place for them to be. I mean, politics, I went over there, absolutely, there was no agenda and none of the guys I knew, well, there was one or two that did, but very, very few of those guys had any agenda other than taking care of their buddies and getting home. You know, the politics absolutely meant nothing. But we found out real quick that what we were told before we went wasn't necessarily, you know, pertinent when you got into the jungle. Yeah, I mean, I got disillusioned very quickly with that because, I mean, we're taking away these people's country. You know, we're destroying their livelihood because, I mean, they were some of the most bombed people in the world and their homes were destroyed. Most of them were made out of bamboo and, and straw. So they weren't all that substantial, the people in the villages. And if they lost that, they lost everything. Um, their animals, they kept pigs and chickens and, and water buffalo, which is something you don't want to mess with. Uh, but 
they also got destroyed, got killed in a lot of these firefights. And then how did they feed their family? At the time, I think at 19 years old, those sorts of things didn't have the impact that they do to me now. As you and I have spoke about, though, that, that most of the Marines you serve with, if not, you know, the 99.9%, were just doing their job and, right. and trying to get home. Right. But you yourself, after you know, spending your time in, in, in country, um, seeing the worst of, of humanity, if you would, um, you and being wounded, and I don't want to leave that out, and receiving a Purple Heart, you chose to stay in and make a career of it, though, correct? Yeah, uh, I don't think that's what I was thinking when I came home. Uh, I had gotten married just before I went, which probably wasn't the smartest choice I ever made in my life. And on her part, too, because she was a year younger than I was. And uh, also from a very difficult family background. And when I came home, my head was really not well put together. A lot of the things I had seen a lot of things I experienced. Um, one of the biggest things that corpsmen suffer from is survivor guilt. Why couldn't I do this? Why couldn't I keep this guy from dying? People that you live with every day, people that you took care of every day, people you talk to, you sit up in the middle of the night having conversations with. And the next day you go out and they get hit and no matter what you do, the best you can do, you can't keep them alive until the chopper comes. So when I got home, I wasn't prepared to go out there and just say, okay, I'm done. This is over. I'm finished. When my enlistment comes up, I'm just going to go back to life as normal. Uh, I wasn't ready for that. I had skills. I've been given skills by the military. They gave me some training and I was uh, interested in medicine to begin with before I went. So, okay, I don't want to make any big changes right now because I don't know if the decisions I would make would be the best ones for myself and my family. So I stayed in. And then as time went on, I took additional training with the pharmacy school, went to independent duty school. Um, and then the more educated I became, the more, uh, the more interested I was in making this a career. But still, it was service. You know, I wanted to be able to continue to serve. Sounds kind of corny, but that's the way it works. Not at all, Bob. I think that shows the type of person you are and the type of person many of your uh, fellow brothers and sisters that were in the service. It's something ingrained in them, and whether if they were drafted or enlisted like you or, or, or whatever reason, once they found that calling, they realized that they could uh, help a lot of folks. And you talk about your career, uh, 26 years, I believe you've told me, and you talk about taking a lot of folks under your wing, if you would. Obviously, with that much time, you get a lot of uh, uh, um, Marines under you and, and different corpsmen. Do you believe your time in Vietnam led to uh, better leadership or, or, or not? Well, it was partly, I learned a lot from Vietnam. Um, I was not the same person when I came home that I was before I left. You know, a lot of the naivete that you have is 19 and just getting out of, well, I was 17 when I got out and then turned 18 when I joined the Navy, but by the time I got to Vietnam, I was 19. But still, you're a kid. You don't have much life experience. But when I came home, a lot of the things that I thought were important uh, before I went were not so important anymore. You know, the things that uh, really, to me, meant a lot is the things that are going to affect you for the rest of your life, decisions you make how you behave towards other people, you know, um, you know, it's, it's not in me. It's never been in me to be a judge of other people, you know, by how they look, how they dress or whatever. 
because individually I realized that you are really in your own skin and you have to, to deal with situations just for you. And I can't make decisions for somebody else. I can't say this is wrong. You shouldn't have done this. Okay. The military helps and they have a set of rules that you have to follow. But the important thing about that is when they bring somebody up to you say, okay, he did this. What are you going to do? Well, are you going to take him up to the CEO? For me, it's context. If it's, there's a clear context here, he did X and he was supposed to do Y. Well, why did you do X? What was involved with this? What, who else was involved? And when you figure out all these other things, you tend to be not so cut and dried on the judgments and the things that you do. And sometimes I had to bring him to the CO because the regulations were pretty clear. You know, if he violated this one, then there's a certain amount of discipline that's required. But you also have to realize that he's going through a point of his life or she's going through a point of her life that they're learning how to make good life decisions. And it doesn't come naturally. I mean, these are all things you learn by sometimes by mistakes, sometimes really bad mistakes. But uh, you all have to learn. And you have to be given the opportunity to realize, okay, this was probably not the best thing I should have done. What should I have done? And then if you sit down with these guys, because I had a lot of people come into my office, I was independent duty on submarines for 20 years and several different submarines. And I was the medical guy, the dental guy, atmosphere control, psychologist, you know, all of the things, anything to do with the welfare of the crew. And everybody from the commanding officer down, that was my responsibility. And a lot of these kids, very intelligent. I mean, these are the cream of the crop that come into the submarine service. Uh, but they're kids. You know, you, they go through school, you go through all of this training, you have this education crammed in your head. You're told that you're the best that there is. And, of course, the Marines are the same way. But the submariners get paid a lot. So they have all this money, they've got the education, they have the intelligence, but they have no experience. They don't know what to do with that stuff. So you find out somebody comes in, sits in my office, and is crying. Maybe he's not doing so good in his division, and his division chief tells him to come see me. Well, it turns out on submarines, at least on the ballistic missile submarines, you have two crews. You have the blue crew and the gold crew, and they split up time on the submarines. And while you have the ship, you don't go home. So it's usually about uh, 90 days where you have responsibility for the ship. And you may be out at sea for that entire time. Well, the other crew is back in port. And you have just married this young 19-year-old woman who now is at home alone, has a big submariner salary in her pocket. And she also has not learned how to make good life decisions. Now, not everybody's like that. Some people do extremely well. Some people made good choices because they had good examples on how to make a good choice. But the vast majority of them would be in my office telling me, well, you know, she hooked up with this guy on the other crew. Well, the same submarine. Not a different submarine, but the same submarine, but a different crew. So they know each other. They train together. And really poor choice. So you'd have to sit down with them and say, okay, well, what are you going to do? What can you do? Because we're going to see in a month. So, yeah, I mean, I end up being papa to a lot of these guys. Obviously, they needed it. and uh, You were forced to grow up so quickly. I, you weren't necessarily papa, but, um, you know, at 19, 20, you were the leader of guys your age or, or even some a little bit older, kind of keeping that group together. About that, um, we talk a little bit about band of brothers, camaraderie, uh, all of that. I mean, there's so many words for it, but what's the importance of that? One, in country in, during the war, but also in your 26 years, making those guys and gals on the submarine realize that they're in it together. Well, the thing about the military is you have to, you have to work as a team. I mean, there are no solo players out there. You can't be. 
everyone's life depends on the person next to them, and some more than others. If the person cannot depend on you to be there and do what you're supposed to do, then you know, they don't have confidence that they can go ahead and do their job and realize somebody has their back. And when you do this and you live with people 24 hours a day and in some places, in some cases like Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan, where you don't know if tomorrow something's going to come in and land on your head or not, is the guy that you're living in the barracks with or the guy you depend on, the corpsman or whoever it is, if you can't depend on them to do what's necessary, then, you know, your life is a little crazy because there's no confidence that things will be okay. You know, if you feel like you're there on your own and by yourself, then tomorrow, it doesn't make any sense because I'm not going to be here tomorrow because I can't depend on somebody to be there when I'm doing something up here and in the submarine same way I mean that's a very dangerous job I mean you think about 120 to 140 guys in this pressurized tube that contains all these nuclear weapons in some cases but high pressure air 4,000 pound air if you rupture a, a, a pipe that's got 4,000 pound air in it you're done your toast and you got water under pressure lots of dangerous things ships are the same way you got a lot of guys airmen that you know are 40,000 feet in the air if people are next to you or not doing their job you're gonna die so that builds what you're talking about the camaraderie the guys in the ritual team that I work with you know I didn't share any of those experiences with them personally but still they're my brothers because individually they had the same experience as I did. So you count on them. It's what you do. I'd like to actually talk a little bit about that because it, to me what you're talking about, one, in Vietnam, in the submarine, I, I, I know you. So you find an importance in that in the veterans community too. What would you say to the veterans that may be watching the importance of you know, building a group of veterans around you to make sure you kind of have still someone to watch your back and someone with that shared experience? Well, you know, I, I have a certain amount of disability coming out of the military, and all of it is on PTSD. You know, for the stuff I went through, the survivor's guilt, if I hadn't had the career I had with the people I connected with, and unfortunately, a lot of guys that I knew that got out of the military are left adrift. There's nobody there for them. Their family really doesn't understand what they've been through. My wife, God bless her, a lot of the stuff that I talk about with uh, the people I work with or the guys on the ritual team, she, she doesn't even know about because I don't talk to her about that. You know, it would be well beyond her possibility to understand. She'd want to, but... When you connect with people that have been through this stuff, even potential, you know, I'm in a job, maybe I didn't go into combat, but I had a job that would potentially send me there and I volunteered. I'm standing up to do this. You have the same sort of connection to the guys that you work with that that guy in combat has because the potential's there. I mean, so the guys that go in during times of peace, we say, oh, no, that's that's no big deal. You're going to sit in an office somewhere around a ship, and you're going to sail around and have a good time. Any moment, the, the balloon may go up, and you have to stand up and do your job. What I would say to the veterans is don't isolate yourself. I knew a lot of guys. I came back, and I used to go uh, fishing up in the Gunflit Trail in, in Minnesota, up in the, the boundary waters up there. I had a business in Duluth, Minnesota during a time between I got out because I was so angry at one of the CEOs that decided that everything I did to get the submarine ready for commissioning was wrong. And uh, I said, no, I, I went through two years of very arduous commissioning a submarine from a set of rings on a building way 
until a commission submarine. All of the records, all of the stuff that had to be done, um, all the radiation, because I was radiation health officer also. And he came and said, no, doc, this is wrong. You screwed up. All right, I've had enough. Because between that and PTSD, I just felt there was so much pressure, I couldn't deal with it anymore. So I got out for six years. So if I hadn't gone out, I would have been in 30 years. But uh, yeah, I, I got out for a period of time. And the guys that, uh, I, there was a guy I knew up in Minnesota that had gotten out of the Marine Corps and disappeared into the woods. He would come out, he would get supplies, he had a bunker up in the woods. He had barbed wire around his place. He didn't want to see anybody. He didn't want anybody to come close. We connected because we had done the same stuff. So I would go up and see him once a year. The only time he would ever come out of the woods was to get some of the supplies he would need, but he wouldn't talk to anybody. And you can't do that. You need, you need other people to live your life. You can't particularly with all of the stuff that you stuff inside with the experience that you have, you, you need other people to help you with that, other vets. So that's important. To, to another group that may be watching, what would you tell a, a kid or a teenager that may be watching this? Why is it important that we remember these stories of Vietnam and, and and, and hear the firsthand experience. Well, well, we live in a period of time now that there's, uh, there's stuff going on a long way from home. Iraq, Afghanistan, people are over there putting their lives in danger every day. And you see it on the news. And as a teenager, you say, okay, I'm, maybe I know somebody that's there. Maybe I don't. The vast majority of teenagers don't have personal contact with somebody who has been to Iraq. They see the things, the commercials on the TV, guys without legs coming home, let's help these guys. It's very, very important. But when I was 19 and this farm kid, I had no thought that that would ever happen to me. You know, I came off uh, the streets where, you know, there was hamburgers on the corner. You can go and get a Coke or whatever you want. And the next thing you know, you could be in the middle of a place where you're fighting for your life. Do not think that this cannot happen to you. The world is a dangerous place. It's a crazy place. Stuff can happen at a moment's notice. Somebody makes a decision and guess what? Maybe if, even if you're not in the military, there's nothing saying that it cannot happen here. Nothing saying that all of this craziness that's going on in the world can't come here and end up in your backyard. So don't take this stuff for granted that it's just something you see on the nightly news or in a video or a movie. Because it's real. It's happened to people just like you. Jim. And this wouldn't be necessarily for a corpsman, but somebody that you essentially were the doctor on the submarine, uh, the corpsman. This is going out to all our first responders, our doctors, nurses, firefighters, and, and those serving now. As someone that lived a career of that, and uh, I know that we've talked about the wounds of that, but what what's the the benefit of that selflessness? I mean, what, even with all of the terrible experiences you had to go through deep down something continued to drive you to help others do you mind addressing that a little bit well when I, um, when I went to work um, my son who was 18 just got out of high school was uh, diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma and I had been working as a public health consultant for a cruise line I came back home because my wife working as a needed my help. So I stopped doing that job. And uh, I went to work. I took the training to become an EMT and a paramedic. So I also, I also had those qualifications, EMT and paramedic. I retired from that. But it's where I needed to be, you know, helping other people. When stuff happens, you go there. You don't go there. 
because there's someone that needs your help. That's just who I am. I don't know if that's a coherent answer for you. No, that's a perfect answer. It's a real answer. It's from the heart. I, obviously, you know, you and I speak before this and we kind of know a bit about you, but um, those folks watching, this isn't some scripted thing. This is just a, a real one-on-one -on -one conversation to hear this firsthand experience. And I want to thank you, Bob, for sharing your story. Um, because I know like many of our veterans, it, it's not an easy thing to do. It's very and, hard. Very hard. But it means so much, not just to me as the host or the Pueblo City County Library District for this particular program, but for everyone that watches this and everybody that will watch it, I believe there's nothing better than hearing the firsthand experience of our veterans, not just the, the bad parts, but, you know, there's no better way to explain history than, than from the mouths of those who lived it. Would well, Matt, like one of the things that I'm seeing that's happening now is a lot of the generations coming up because of the availability, not only of social media, but all kinds of media bombarding them, particularly VR right now. My grandson's really into VR. And it becomes their source of input of, on life. Don't let that happen. Don't let, don't become a passive, uh, not a participant, because you're not. Don't become a passive receiver of what comes in to have you live your life. You need to get out there and experience things. You. You know, some of it's not going to be very good. Some of it is going to be a little painful, but it builds character. It helps you become a person. Whatever that input coming in in social media or in the videos and stuff coming in, that's all make-believe. You can't base your life on that. And, you know, it sounds like maybe, you know, I'm dissing all of the current technology and stuff. But what it's doing is it removes people from the reality of what happens in life. You step back, you become a spectator instead of a participant. Um, you know, the people that inherit this world after I'm gone and this generation is gone, you can't be a spectator. You're going to have to be a participant. Otherwise, you're going to get exactly what you deserve. The, the world is coming. If you don't frame it, then something else will. It's, it's such a great point, and I think we often hear, especially nowadays, that this is the worst time ever, but you lived through tumultuous times. Obviously, the generation before you, when the Nazis were had taken over Europe and the Japanese had taken over China and were, were taking over the islands and, and had bombed Pearl Harbor, obviously a tremendously tumultuous time, World War One. as a, I know you love your history like I do. Uh, we always have these tumultuous times. Well, you think and about the think formation of this country. What did these people suffer? What yeah. did they live through in order to for their family to live a better life than they had? I mean, it's not that they sat back and let things happen to them. They really had to go out and create this life that they wanted to be reality for them. Everyone wants their children or their next generation, their grandchildren to live a better existence than they do. That's just human nature. But you don't get that unless you're hands on. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Matt, but that's something that's, for me, it's, it's a big issue because I see a lot of this happen now. You know, people are way too passive about the things that happen in their life. You said something that struck me um, in a conversation we've previously had about your service and about being in Vietnam, being a young man. And uh, you said the key to it was you were just an average American kid. I came off the street, I, I mean, a farm kid. And you would recognize a farm kid from Central California if they had the same sort of upbringing I had, just the same now as I was back then. The world has changed, but people don't change that much. You know, you have a set of expectations in life for whatever reason you build up, whether it's your upbringing, what you were taught in school, your heroes, your whatever it is. And then 
when the reality of a situation like Vietnam hits you or whatever it is, you know, a hurricane coming in out of the Gulf, um, you realize that those expectations weren't real. <laughs> Other stuff happens and it's beyond your control and you have to adapt. If you don't adapt, it will swallow you. I mean, people are very resilient. And for the most part, people really want to help someone who is having a hard time with whatever it is, particularly Americans. I mean, they will volunteer to go do whatever, uh, whatever needs to be done. You know, and you hear a lot of people saying, oh, that's exceptionalism. That's uh, what imperialism. You, you hear stuff like that all the time. But human nature is, regardless of what political persuasion you are, if someone is in need, if you have a heart, if you have um, any kind of desire or any kind of humanity about you, you want to do something to alleviate that pain and suffering. We spoke about this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to finish as I finish with all of our uh, veterans. We talked about pain and suffering just right then. What would you say to a veteran that may be watching this that is going through some pain and suffering? Reach out. Contact people who can help you because there's a lot of people out there that are looking for you. They know that we lost a lot of people. There's a lot of people when we came home that made it home physically, but emotionally, mentally, psychologically, they didn't. And some of them are still out there. I, I deal with that from time to time. My wife will tell you about that. But there are people that want to have you close to them that they can help you come out of that. Because you can't do it by yourself. You know, the, the worst thing that happens when you isolate yourself like that is all of the negative self-talk and all of the stuff that's happened to you, that's all you have. You can't talk yourself out of a hole. You know, one, one of the, the images that I use when I talk to my children about this, I said, okay, um, you're walking down this road and uh, I've been down there before and I know that if you go there, there's a steep cliff that if you keep going that road, you're going to fall off. So don't go that way. Let me show you a path that goes around there. But no, I got to learn it for myself. I've got to do it myself. I got to figure this out myself. Well, if you do that and you make the wrong choice, you go off the cliff. You need to be able to trust people, to reach out and trust. Trust is a very difficult thing for uh, particularly war veterans, not just Vietnam, but Iraq and Afghanistan too. Trusting other people because they have all kinds of stuff that they've had to push inside in order to live their life day to day, take care of their families, just function in society. And when you're alone, that stuff comes out. That's all you have. Because like I said before, there's a lot of stuff I can't even tell Carla. She sees it from the periphery. She sees the effects of it, but she doesn't understand it. She doesn't know why. So don't isolate yourself. I just want to say a tremendous from the heart. Thank you for sharing um, all of it. Uh, this brings up, you know, the end of our hour together, but amazing. And I thank you for opening up, speaking from your heart. I think that your words are going to impact a lot of people, whether civilian, kid or veteran. Uh, to everybody watching, please remember to participate in the All Pueblo Wreath program, The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. Uh, you can learn more about the program at PuebloLibrary.org and get your tickets a week from today. November 5th, 6.30 p.m. Um, is the Book Lovers Ball, where Tim will be presenting and talking about the things they carried. So go online once again, PuebloLibrary.org. And this being the last of our Voices of the Vietnam Era, at least for this year, um, a big thank you to all of you who watched and from all of us at the Center for American Values and the Pueblo City Library District. We want to thank you. Have a good night and thank you for watching.